Hey friends, DM Khan here. Thanks for stopping by the channel. So in this video series, we're going to recreate a Roots Radix song that's by Freddie McGregor called Big Ship. But I need to start this with a disclaimer saying that I am not a professional drummer. I mean, maybe I'm a pretty good en mix engineer. I just wanna give back and show you how I'm trying to recreate that sound. Obviously, I'm not Style Scott, and I'm not Flabaholt, and I'm not the Roots Radix, but um, this is my sort of attempt and my best effort at trying to achieve that sound. I think everyone can agree that the Roots Radix backing anybody mixed by scientists captured in Studio One is probably the best sound ever. So it's for the love of that that I'm making this video, and I don't know the actual way that they did it. This is only my interpretation of how I did it. And I'm also not a very good drummer. I've only been playing for about nine months just in my spare time. With that kind of disclaimer out of the way, I just wanna say I love that music and I hope that you guys get something out of this. This is not like a purist thing. I'm not saying this is how it was done. This is just my best attempt at trying to, you know, emulate that sound that I love so much. So I'm going to go through kind of the tuning and the miking and what mics and the miking technique of this drum kit here. Um, and we'll start with the kick drum and the shell pack. Um, this kick drum is a 20 inch kick by 16 inch deep. And I got this shell pack for a hundred bucks off Craigslist. It's a vintage mahogany kit. If I had to guess, I think it's a cheaper kit from the 70s from like Japan or something. Somebody, you know, had the idea of let's take it all apart. Let's stain it. Let's recut the bearing edges and, you know, put it back together. They cut the edges, they stained it, but then they never did anything with it. And it sat in somebody's garage for like 20 years. Um, so I took it, sanded those bearing edges, put it all back together, and I got it sounding pretty good. It sounds vintage specific. I've got some Aquarian super kick uh, heads here and basically for the resonant head, if you use a resonant head, which I am, you just want it just tight enough so that it doesn't sound like paper, you know, thwack, thwacking along. And then the front basically has to do with the depth of the sound as well as the response of the beater. So if you have it too tight, then you're going to get this kind of like it almost like bounces off too easily um, when you just hit it, you know? Um, and so I just kind of tuned it just loose enough. I wanted it as loose as possible because it's not a very big kick, you know, in size. So I wanted it as deep as possible, but also to have a good response for the kick beater. So I know that's not that specific, but that's what I can show you. As far as dampening, I have one medium sized bath towel that I've kind of folded in half. Um, and pressed up against the beater side. And then I have a bed sheet. I think it's like a king size bed sheet that I rolled up probably three times and tucked just behind um, the towel so that it's on the resonant side head so that, you know, the decay isn't too long. If you listen to it, you know, it doesn't last forever. Now, with that said, I think the channel one sound was a little bit even tighter than that. So I will be doing some gating to just tighten that up even more. But I heard it was a 24 inch kick. That's massive and not a very deep one, but just filled with pillows and it's just super low end and a good quick attack. Anyways, the toms are kind of interesting on this kit because it came with two 12 inch toms, which is weird. It makes me think that's why it was a cheaper kit because why wouldn't you have a 12 and a 13? You know what I mean? That was kind of what they had back then usually. And then a 16 inch floor tom. As far as tuning, I tuned the floor tom and this tom here as physically low as I possibly could um, without it sounding just completely dead and it actually having a note. So if you hear the floor tom, you know, that's as low. And then this one, I basically just tuned it up. And, you know, you go in a star pattern and you just slowly tune it. I tuned it first, then I put the dampening on. And then you have to mess with the tuning again. But if you hear the attack, it might last a second. It's like boom, not boo, and not but, you know? You can hear the note, 
but it doesn't go on forever. And because I'm using overheads, you know, if I had a super long decay, then that would be picked up on the overheads. And I want to gate these toms so that they only open up so I don't hear that mic the whole time. You know, the gate only opens when I hit it and then it closes again. It keeps it, you know, super tight sounding and you don't have all that kind of resonance that you're hearing from inside that tom from that mic being picked up. Only when it's hit. Right? Um, so here's the kick. Tom. So now onto the snare. Oh, I guess we'll talk about the timbali because this timbali, um, I have this because it's resonant when I talk. Um, this timbali is actually the snare drum that came with the kit, but I've converted it to a timbali. I didn't want to buy a timbali, and people on um, this reggae um, and ska drumming forum, I was asking, hey, do I need a timbali? And they said, no, man, just take the, the snare and make it into a timbali. So I have a Remo controlled sound. Um, you know, it's a 10, 10 mil ply with, I think, a, a 5 mil dot or, yeah, uh, head. And then I literally just cranked it up as, as high as I could do without, like, I can't turn it anymore. <laughs> right? And it's, it's got a really kind of a longer decay than maybe what it needs, but I like it. I don't know. Um, so that's that. I didn't mention the, the type of the type of heads on the toms. This is just cheap one ply G2 uh, Evans G2 heads. And, you know, obviously um, they're mic'd with. Um, I didn't talk about mics yet. So the kick drum, going back to the kick, the kick drum is mic'd with two mics. And you don't need two. I just have two. And I think it's kind of, it sounds good when you kind of make a blend of the two. So I have a clone of the Shure, uh, I think it's the 91A. This is a Behringer 91A. It's a boundary mic and it picks up the real low end nicely. Um, and then I also have a Shure Beta 52 that I got from Kerrigan. Thank you, Kerrigan. He sent me that. And um, that one has a nice attack. And I have it set just six inches in, the, the B52. Um, six inches in, just below the beater to you know, pick up the attack. And then I have the other one down there sitting on the, on the blanket. Um, so yeah, it's a good kick sound. And then these toms are all mic'd from below up at me, um, six inches down facing kind of level, um, perpendicular with the, the angle of the drum, just straight up, um, onto, you know, and these are Sennheiser E604s and I have the three toms all have the same mic, you know? just to keep that consistent. The timbali, I just have a SM57. We heard that um, on the top. Sometimes I've heard people miking from the bottom. I haven't tried that yet. I do want to try it. Um, okay, now onto the snare. So this snare is a Ludwig Raw Brass Phonic. And I already have the Ludwig Superphonic, which I use for that kind of Carlton Barrett sound. So I wanted something different. When I heard this snare, I was like, man, it's got that super raw, raw sound, deep sound. So that's why I like it. You know, it's something a little bit different. You could certainly get away with lots of different types of snare drums. I know that Style often used the Ludwig Superphonic, same with Carlton. This is a Ludwig Superphonic, but it's just made out of brass. Same idea, but different, different metal. And it, it's a nice snare drum. So I've got a SM57 on top, pretty close to the head here as well as a cheaper um, Tom mic on the bottom. I don't even know what brand it is. It doesn't really matter. Um, so that's the snare. And then for the muffling, I have a, this is like a, what you wax your car with. I got it from an auto parts store. It's like a two ply kind of rag that's stitched together. I have it folded in half just on the edge of the drum here. I found that that is like the perfect amount of decay. If I have have it less, it just doesn't quite sound right. Or if I, I often see people putting it like on it, which there's nothing wrong with that sound, but I like to have the response of the drum head. You know, I like to hit the actual head, you know? So 
that's that. And as far as tuning the snare drum, um, you want to go for the foundation note at around 200 hertz. Watch my other video, um, Secret to the Roots Radix snare drum or whatever, uh, and follow those steps. I show you like how to do it, but then just check it on a meter. I got the fundamental is around 200 hertz. I think it's like 180 on this right now, but get it in that ballpark. Also, um, tighten the bottom head a little bit more than on that other video. I think it's just, it gives a little bit of a tighter sound. Okay. Um, hi-hat. This hi-hat is a, an, a 14 inch, a, a Zildjian, a custom top. And on the bottom, it's a Zildjian, obviously 14 inch, um, quick beat. And the quick beat doesn't have a bell on it. It's just flat and it has four holes in it to relieve the pressure. Um, Kerrigan told me that, that that's a good one to get. So I got the quick beat bottom and I got a new beat top. But then I recently got this A Custom, which is a little bit brighter and I like it. So now the mic for this is a Shure SM81, which is used a lot on overheads and on hi-hat. So I have this here kind of miking the edge of the hi-hat. It's about two and a half inches away, pointed down and kind of away from the kit just to get a little bit more isolation from, from bleed, you know, obviously you're going to get bleed, but I face it a little bit away as opposed to towards the snare. Cause then you're picking up even more snare and everything else. Um, you know, you can, other techniques are miking the bell. You'll get a nice kind of that overtone, um, ringing kind of sound. This one's better. I think it's a little more balanced sounding for this hi-hat. The other technique that you can try is actually facing it kind of away from the from the hi-hat and like if here's the hi-hat you know facing put it putting it well i guess like this putting it away from it just facing down and it gives the kind of off axis sound and that can be nice but this that's better for brighter mics this mic sounds good like this just from my trial and error okay now overheads these are u87 clones um from mikeparts.com it's the s387 so basically it's a u7 u87 ai um but it's transformerless and it has a super low noise floor so i got a pair of those and they just they capture the sound of the kit um i know back in the early studio one days i heard that they didn't even use overhead mics um they just use you know the tom mics are facing up so you kind of get that bit of uh symbol but they eventually did start using overheads and i think for the kind of vintage modern sound i'm going for I like to have them, especially for the symbol, you know, you, you, you kind of need it. So these symbols are Zildjian K dark, thin crashes. And, um, I think they sound cool cause they're dark. They're not overly bright. You certainly can use brighter ones like the a customs. I see a lot of drummers actually using those, but I like these cause it's, it's, um, I don't like really harsh, bright sounding cymbals. I like kind of chill, mellowed ones. Cause I mean, in reggae, you don't, you really don't even need two, but um, you're only, you're not playing the cymbals that often. You know what I mean? It's an accent thing. It's not like you're, you're wailing on the cymbals all the time. I mean, newer modern reggae, sure. But back then, you know, they're probably, they really only needed one. I mean, they, a lot like, this song we're going to play, Big Ship, I think he uses one tom and one and one crash. So really, he doesn't even need this whole setup. He doesn't use a timbali, but I have one here. So I wanted to show a little bit on how I set up these overheads. And basically, if you take a tape measure or a guitar cable like this, and you go from the center of the snare to one overhead, then you go over to the other one, it should pretty much be the same distance and that way you get a phase coherency as far as left right your snare is the same volume in the left and the right it's in the center of the kit when you think about the picture of the overheads really like in rock music the overheads are really the picture of your kit um i don't know you know as far as what they were thinking back there in the studio one days but i'm sure they thought about phase and coherency and all of that stuff because they did it day in and day out and they made such awesome music. Um, 
but yeah, so that's kind of how I set these overheads. This one's a little bit higher than this one. Um, that's just because of where the crashes are. And also the hi-hat is a little bit higher than say my floor tom over here. So this one's a little lower, this one's a little higher, but it's the same distance from the snare. Um, and so yeah, when if we were to listen to the overheads in solo, you'd hear kind of, and if I hard pan them, you would hear that the kick is a little to the right, but that's okay because the snare is the most important thing and the kick is low end and it's going to be mono on the close mics, these two mics. So that pretty much sums up the, um, the setup here. Uh, also, I'm not sure I talked about the toms, you know, as far as muffling the toms, I use a ton of tape and this is gaffer's tape. Um, that's, you know, it's not like duct tape where where it leaves that residue it sticks it doesn't stay sticky forever um but it's kind of nice because you can take it on and off and play it play with it but basically i i set this up so that you get the right decay and i left a space in the middle here because i wanted a place to uh, to actually hit the skin but i've seen toms like this muffled in a lot of different ways you can use foam you can use a piece of a t-shirt and some tape. You know, you don't need all of this tape. You can do it a different way. But the end goal and what I'm kind of trying to teach is that it's all about the length of the decay. You know, it doesn't matter what it looks like. It just matters what it sounds like, you know? And it's to me, it's like boom, 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 you know? Not bet, 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 bet. Although sometimes they did muffle the heck out of their toms. You know, I they didn't really leave it wrung out too long you know i like that that certain sound where it's just the the kind of percussive nature of the tom and um i've also eq'd a little bit of the top end response just to get that kind of thwacky you know quick attack sound from the toms um but certainly because of the e604s they're they're used a lot on toms they have a nice low end you know presence and pickup so that's pretty much it for the setup here, let's get into playing along. Okay, so before we talk about the drums, we need to talk about the awesome piano that was played by Steely. It's Wyclef Steely Johnson. And he was typically, a lot of times, the keyboard player, but on this particular song, he played the piano. And boy, what a piano. You know, it, it really kind of is iconic and... What's interesting also about this song is that there's no organ, so it, the piano's really shining, and to me it sounds like an upright piano, and it's like slightly out of tune when he plays that high F, you know? It's a little bit out of tune, and I just, I love that because, you know, nothing's perfect. So the plugin I'm using is the Cuba plugin uh, by Native Instruments. It's a cool kind of slightly out of tune, um, upright piano, you know. Right? And um, let's compare that to a grand piano just to get a little bit of a difference in sound. It just doesn't, it doesn't fit as well as this upright, you know. And also to kind of accentuate that little bit of warmth and out of tuneness, I have this um, Waves plugin that I've set the wow to like the slowest and I've turned it up quite a bit. Let me accentuate it. You know, it's like really out of tune, kind of like almost vinyl, you know what I mean? So let's put that back to where it was. Okay, so that's the plugin that I'm using, and it's in an attempt to kind of sound old, right? But let's talk about a little bit of the things that Steely did that's iconic um, to this song. So when it starts, he's basically basically going, you know what I mean? So it's kind of like a, that's the chords, but he's just doing like, 
right? Just stepping down from the third to the second to the root. So this song is F. They say it's an F major seven, which is this, but I can't really hear the seven too much in the original. It's really faint if they do it. I mean, he's doing some melodies where he's playing that seventh, like this one. That starts on the seventh, um, which would be F major seven to G minor. But I don't think he played, you know, I don't think he played. That would be with the seventh. I think he just played the G or the F to G minor. So he starts out the. And he's playing this the whole time on his left hand. And then on a certain part of the song, he does this like. So what is he doing? He's doing this like F, then semitone to the next root, which is the G. And then he's doing the same thing, which is the third of, you know, F major. And then he's going back down to the root of G, G which is the root of G minor. So he's doing this kind of semitone. Ba, ba, ba. And then the real iconic part is, so here's, he's going to the high F. So he's starting on the fifth of the second chord to the fourth. And then, so basically D, C, high F. So if I play it all together, it's like, Okay, and then he also does this really cool, um, so it's like, so like I said, he's starting on the seventh of F, and then he's ending on the next root, which is G of G minor, so he's... And then, you know, back to the. So I'm going to attempt to record this. I'm not that great on the piano. Um, I might screw up and have to like kind of fix it, but let's give it a shot. I think th those are the mostly the techniques of what I heard um, in the song. So let's just record it.
that's the idea. Now, I know I didn't play it exactly how he played it, but those little polyrhythms and leads and stuff were in there. And like I said, I'm not the best piano player, but I'm going to fix it up a little bit. And then next, we're going to jump on the drums and we'll play along with the piano. Okay, so before we get into actually playing the drums here, I just want to say how much I love Style Scott. You know, he is by far my favorite reggae drummer. I just love the rub-a-dub rocker's style that the Roots Radix nailed. And it's that tight groove of German bass, you know, Flabaholt, big up Flabaholt, and Style Scott, rest in peace. Um, their marriage of styles together was something that was just undeniable. You know, they were the top charting backing band in Jamaica. I just, I love Style Scott and Flavaholt together. There's something magical about what they did. And, you know, when, when you listen to the kick patterns and how the bass is played on top of that, and, you know, it's like sometimes the bass would, would play with the kick and sometimes intentionally it wouldn't. And just the way that Flava and Style would kind of dance around that kick pattern to kind of sometimes be there and sometimes not be there is really where the magic is. And also, you know, the notes that aren't played is a big, awesome part about that style. So yeah, Style Scott, he's my favorite. And I don't know if he invented this role. I don't know who did. But that kind of intro role that Style Scott did pretty much every song. Um, and it sounds like this. And that's the intro to this big ship. I know I'm not a drummer and I'm not very good, but I, I think it's still important for me to show you guys that role because that's the foundational beginning role that when you hear that, you go, oh, that's Style Scott. Or, oh, that's the Roots Radix. Who are they backing now? So very simply put, most of the time it's four hits. And so you start, I start with one hit on the right and then two, and it's like a, drag you know on the left hand and then you end you time it so that you end with the right hand at the end so it's like right that's the idea and then usually it's one tom or two toms so it'd be like one e and a two e and a three right or Sometimes he added another snare at the end of that roll, so it'd be like. I hope you catch that. So it starts at the foundation, and then another hit with the with the left end. So that you hear a ton, right? And then there's all kinds of variations that you can do around that, you know? You know, those kinds of things. Big Ship is such a great example because it's so simple. What Styly plays on this song, it literally starts with that simplified roll. You know, it's... You know what I mean? And he just comes in with a super simple kick pattern. You know, it's basically what's what some people call the half drop. So it's like just. He's just playing one note on the kick. Simple hi-hat pattern, one snare. That's really it. And sometimes he does the. And then the other fill that he does often, he does it all the time in this song, is just the and I don't know how to really describe it, it's just this. Right? So it's... Super simple, it's just a kind of syncopated, offbeat Tom thing. And then at one point in the song, he just does like a, a simple just, you know, crash where you're playing the kick, um, snare, and cymbal all at once. And that's literally the only fills that are in this song. Just that 
intro. Bam, badam, and it lands right on the, it's just perfectly in the pocket. So I'm gonna attempt to record this and please don't judge me. The whole purpose of this video is not that I'm a good drummer cause I'm not, I'm learning. The intent of this is to show you kind of the recreation of the song. It's not a one to one, but I think really a lot of the value will come from the mic techniques as well as what I'm gonna do post-processing. So I'm gonna record this. I'll probably show a minute of it or whatever. And then we're gonna show the bass because that's the next part and then we'll show kind of how to mix it i'll also do the percussions and the guitar those are really simple in this song if you're liking this video so far please throw me a like subscribe and let's get into the recording Okay, so off camera, I edited the drums so that they were a little bit better in time because obviously I'm not a great drummer, but they're still not processed, but it's time to record the bass. So I just want to say big up, Flava Holt. This is an awesome bass line and it's super simple. There's literally four notes. So it's F, C, D, G, because F is the key. F major seven is the the first chord in the song and then that right below it C is the fifth of F and then it goes over to it slides over to D which is the fifth of the next chord G minor so it's just right that's the bass line. That's like it in its simplest form. Now, obviously, because Flaba is a very dynamic player, he takes out notes. And that's what I said earlier in the video is like, it's not about necessarily what they're playing. I mean, it is, but it's also what they're not playing. So I'm going to play along here and I want you to hear, and I'm going to kind of try to count it out where he's resting. So listen for that. Rest, 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 rest. Right? It has those little pauses in there that it, it just makes it so cool. And uh, obviously what he's playing and how he's playing it is, is awesome, but it's super simple. So it's... That, ba -da -da -da. And sometimes he just plays... He skips that ba -da -da part. It's 
sometimes he does that as well. So those are some, some of the variations. And then also when he does that really cool slide, it's basically right when the, when the G starts. So it's, and then he gets back to that, the start. Ba, 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 ba. Right, so I'll play along a little bit just so you can get it, but it's basically F, C, C, D, G, C, 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 D, F, C, C, D, G, C, C, D, right? It, it, that's, that's basically it in its purest form. Oh, and then at the very end, he also does this really cool walk that's... F, C, D, F, G, C, D, C, right? So we'll play that. You get the idea. And he also actually makes a, a little bit of a boo-boo in this song. He starts on the, he'll start like this. <laughs> he starts, he hits the G instead of the F. Um, but yeah, doesn't matter. The song is so awesome. You know, and that just goes to show you, you know, th these guys recorded it in one take. They didn't have Pro Tools or anything like that to fix it like you know I'm using logic here uh, but anyways that's it for the bass line and um, next we'll record the percussions and the guitar and then we're going to do a mix kind of taking it to that next level kind of like scientists would okay so I just laid down the bass in the DAW and now we're going to talk about the percussions so in this track we have two percussion instruments only the vibra slap and the guiro so in the beginning, he just kind of does this cool pattern on the vibra slap. And then he, I think he, you know, had this in his lap or something. And then he switches over to this and does a. You know, something like that. Um, I've listened to it a bunch, so I'm going to try to nail the vibra slap intro. And then, you know, the Guiro will just be close, but let's give it a shot. get the idea so that's the percussions I'm gonna record that and then we're gonna get into the guitar
Okay, so now we're going to talk about the guitar in this track, and um, I'm not actually sure who played this. It could have been Dwight Pickney, could have been Sowell, uh, could have been Bingy Bunny. I think it was Bingy Bunny, but correct me if I'm wrong. Leave me a comment down below if you know who it was, but it was super simple. Obviously, this is only two chords, and there wasn't a lot of variation. He pretty much played, you know, just straight up. And that's it. And then he did, or, or. Those were really the only um, sort of things that, that he did variation wise. So it was super straight to the point. You know, the piano kind of plays that lead role on the rhythm section. And as I mentioned earlier, there's no organ in this track. So it's pretty bare bones, but it's just, it, honestly, it's the drum and bass section, the piano, and obviously Freddie McGregor that really made it a hit song. Um, and I was listening to a story of, of Freddie actually talking about this song and he's saying when they recorded it, the guys were like, hit song, hit song, yeah. And they, they just knew it, you know. He busted it out at the end of a, um, of a recording session. He's like, hold on guys, let me, let me uh, show you one more. And he just started singing and they knew it right away. And then they tracked it the next time that they tracked, but. Really cool story, and uh, big up Freddie. If you're watching this, I'm a big fan, and uh, maybe we could work someday. Hit me up. <laughs> Anyways, back to the guitar. Um, I've got my Ibanez AM93, which is um, sort of the smaller size hollow body. Um, Tough Lion plays something like this. It's a more expensive version than this, but I got this back used for 500 bucks, probably. 10 years ago or something and I've had it for and I love it it's a great sound and when I listen to the track I think that it's a humbucker guitar just because it kind of has it doesn't have that single coil sound to it. it it has more of like a meteor albeit very bright sound um so yeah I'm plugging this in, straight into my um Fender 5E3 clone that I built it's a tube amp and it just sounds fantastic right out of the box. But I'm also doing a little bit of EQ on the board and I'll show you that setting there, but, and kind of a comparison of the two different sounds. So here's without any uh, EQ. And here's with the EQ. Without It's a lot darker with and that's because when I hear it when I listen to that song it's very bright the um, the guitar tone is nice and bright articulate obviously to give that kind of chop on top of the piano and um, oh also one last thing before we start playing along to the track is if you haven't watched my last videos um, these are earplugs, and basically it's because I'm not the greatest guitarist, so it's, it's just muting the low two strings. That way I'm playing a triad plus the lower octave. Um, so for example, here's the F major, and here's the G minor, as opposed to like me trying to do this, you know what I mean? I just, I never learned it that way. Yeah, call it a cheat, but whatever. I mean, hey, I'm playing drums, bass, keys, whatever. I'm not going to be good at everything, right? Um, oh, also, one last other thing as far as like the note length or the note content that he's playing is it's very percussive, almost no note content. Like here would be no note content where I'm just resting my fingers on the strings. That would be no note content. This would be like full note content which obviously they don't do. So it's somewhere in the middle, closer to no note content than full. Right? Not, and not, right in the middle. Just to get enough quack. And then, you know, he does, when he's doing the variations, he's, he's holding on on the upstroke. So let's start playing along to the track. And again, forgive me if I suck and screw this up, but 
It's just so you can get an idea. All right, you get the idea. So I was actually doing a lot more variation than he was, and I know I messed up on a lot of the notes, but that's pretty much the guitar in this track. Um, I'm going to record it, and then I'm um, sadly to say this is the end of this video, and in the next video, I'm going to take all the tracks that we've recorded and mix them. So please, if you've liked this video so far, like it, and subscribe if you haven't. Please click the little bell so that you're notified of future videos. And it's been a pleasure having you here with me. I'll catch you on the next video. Peace.